Okay, so we will uh, move right on here. We are in the ninth chapter now of Isaiah. So if you've been following along, last week we ended chapter 8 and it was dark. It was very dark. In fact, at the end it, it said that they would look at the earth and it would be, they'd see trouble and darkness and gloom and anguish and they'd be driven into darkness as it was uh, speaking in terms of the tribulation. And as I shared with you, we're going through Isaiah. Remember that Isaiah jumps around, he jumps around throughout prophecy and we take it apart and kind of try to put it together where it goes. And it not only shares prophecy of this time, of Isaiah's time, but also the time of Christ and the prophecy filled by him and the prophecies yet to come, amen, that, in, that have to do with us as well. So let's have another word of prayer and we are going to dive right in, amen. And Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord, in your word. And we do continue to lift up Peter, our brother to you, Lord, and we thank you that in your mercy you've taken Peter John home and ended those trials, Father, and now we ask that your ministry will be with them. And the entire family, Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to be with us tonight as we open your word in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So, um, the opening is this. Nevertheless, hang in there. <laughs> right? Wow. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a difficult day for sure, you know. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna circle the wagons like we always do, amen. And we're gonna just keep right on moving through this thing. So he goes on now. This is a little bit of a better chapter for the most part, um, depending on what perspective or what side of this you're on, I guess I suppose. But the very opening of chapter nine is a polar opposite of the end of chapter eight. It says, "Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed." And this was a uh, a play on words that, nevertheless, it's not going to last. All this stuff that we just read about, that we've been reading about, yes, it, it came to pass, and it will come to pass, but it won't last. And I know it's difficult, especially, you know, in stuff that we're, we're experiencing today, um, to hang in there sometimes, you know, when you, you think you don't have anything left to hang on with. And... Uh, this is where that faith comes in, you know, and, and we try to hang in there. So what he says here is, well, we're going to read tonight. I'm only going to have only gonna do seven verses tonight because there's, there's quite a bit in here. In fact, I wouldn't even be able to cover all of it in one night. I'd have to break this up if we were doing separate studies like that because there's so much that's happening in this one little spot. So he's going, okay, so kicks out the bed says, hang in there. It's going to get better. It's going to get bad, but it's going to get better. He said it the, the second half of verse 1, as when, it, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. And the lightly esteemed part, if you remember back as we were going through this, that Ephraim, Syria, and Israel were kind of coming together because they were getting ready to jump Judah, right? And God was trying to get Ahaz's attention. But Ahaz shows to go make a deal with the Assyrians. And so he pressed more heavily and afterward more heavily oppressed her by way of the sea beyond the Jordan in the Galilee of Gentiles. And this is when Assyria came sweeping down. Now, the lands that we're talking about here, Zebulun and Naph Naphtali, these are part of the 12 tribes that split up at the time of, of Joshua. Now, we're going we're gonna to jump to Matthew in a second because I want to show you something here in a minute. But to understand where this is happening from and why we know what's happening is because if I, if I was the Sea of Galilee right now, if you're looking at a map, there's like a big map here, this would be Naphtali over here. This would be Zebulun right here. <laughs> and this would be Capernaum right here. This is Assyria up here from the north. And they're going to sweep down. And the second verse is going to explain the hang in there part. 
sort of. He says in verse 2, now keep in mind the, the word Galilee of the Gentiles, okay? Because, do we have any Jewish people in here that are Jewish? No? Okay. I, I do have Jewish friends somewhere out there. They're just not here tonight. In that case, we're all Gentiles in here then. We are all Galilee of the Gentiles. We, we would have been the ones in this area that's about to get hammered. He says in verse 2, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. So what's happening here is that Galilee, Zebulun, um, Naphtali, they were going to get the first wave of the Assyrians. And, and there would be wave after wave, and it would sweep all the way down through Judah into Egypt. Assyria would take over a lot. But these people would be the first ones when the wave went by. They would be the first ones to see sort of when the smoke clears, so to speak. They would be the ones that saw the light. And so that little, that little piece of one and two right there has so much to say to all of us tonight in terms of being in Galilee of the Gentiles was a very dark place for these people to be in. They were trapped. They were swamped. They were hammered. Yet they survived. Just like he said, nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. It's not going to last forever. It's going to come, and it's going to go. Now, go with me over to Matthew right quick. If you got your Bibles out, jump with me over to Matthew 4. Let me show you something cool here. Matthew 4, 12 is where we're going to start in this little section. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put to prison, put in prison, he departed to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Remember Capernaum? That was this one right here. Which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. So, it's like, okay, so there's a prophecy, and he, like, showed up there, and, you know, kind of all lined up. But verse 17 is the key to this whole thing, because verse 17 says, From that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that's where he set up shop to begin his ministry. And this was, all this happened right after the wilderness temptation thing with Satan and all that stuff. And so this prophecy that was spoken way back in Isaiah's time was fulfilled in Isaiah's time. The Assyrians came through, all hell broke loose, and that time passed, and those that survived that weren't swept away were able to continue a relationship with God, and we'll get to that as we move through the book of Isaiah. Then take the same prophecy and you move it 750, 800 years forward. And now you have Jesus coming at a time of great darkness. The Roman Empire completely oppressing Israel, Judah. Um, a lot of corruption in the, the puppet government that was set up by Rome. A lot of corruption in the temple, in the priesthood. And the people were truly in darkness. And then right where prophecy said it was going to happen, and, and not like a couple hundred miles that way or a couple hundred miles that way, but exactly where prophecy said it was going to happen, Jesus showed up and set up his ministry and began moving forward. Well, to be honest with you, he began moving straight to the cross as was his ministry in the first place. And the benefit for us is in the next chapter. For us that have been consumed in darkness, our lives before Christ, when we saw that light for the first time, wherever we were, 
That was Zebulun, Naphtali, Galilee of the Gentiles, Egypt, whatever you want to call it. We saw that light as well. And we can pick up our story in verse 14 of chapter 5. If you turn the page, it goes like this. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And this is what Jesus did. Jesus was our great example. Jesus went through all kinds of stuff. But where he went, he continued to be a light, wherever it was. And I make that, I use that verse quite a bit when I'm talking about outreach and things like that, that we be a light out there in a dark world. And I got to tell you, man, maybe, maybe sometimes you feel like your light's dimming out, man, you know, and it happens. Tonight, today's a pretty, you know, pretty good example of, of a dim light. It's hard when somebody loses a child. It's even harder when they lose a second child. It's hard to understand, man, and comprehend that stuff. And it, it's like a razor's edge of you make a decision right now, whether you're going to trust God and his will and his plan, or you're just going to fall off the wagon and jump back. But I'm going to tell you, man, I'm not jumping back into the darkness, all right? I ain't going to do it. it. I fought too hard to get where I am right now. And I'm going to believe that there's a plan, and he'll reveal as he chooses, amen? You know why? Because he's God and I'm not. <laughs> so look what happens here. This is kind of an interesting part here that I'll share with you. I don't know what, how much it matters, but he says, You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. Makes sense, right? A lot of people in the time of Christ got gave their lives to Christ. They got saved. A lot of, a lot of you know, by the thousands, man. Remember when Peter at Pentecost went and did his thing? I'm sure people were getting saved all over the place. And the apostles scattered, went around the world. You know, Paul bounced all over the place. And ultimately, somehow, they ended up here in America, right? Or we wouldn't even be here in this room right now. So yeah, that, that did happen, and it certainly did increase our joy. And now every day since we've been saved, it's a party, right? No? Oh, okay. Well, just so you know, I never said that anywhere in this Bible, that every day being a Christian is going to be a big, happy, yucky, fun day, or your whole life is going to be just a nonstop joy fest. In fact, I think it's different now because... Years ago, when stuff jumped off, we just did more drugs. Or whatever our deal was, you know, that we escaped our thing. And it never really solved anything. Like, I never paid bills. I never, I never registered a car until I was in my 30s, man. I never even had a driver's license. Well, I had it at 15. They took it by 17. And I didn't get it back until I was 36. But for some reason, they wouldn't give me one. But post-Christ, I've only had two addresses. I've only had two jobs, you know. He, there's, a, there's, a distinct, there's a distinction between my past and my life with Christ. It hasn't been, you know, the greatest every day, but you know what? I have a lot of joy in my life. But this particular verse here has a note, and it's really an interesting note because this, you have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. In, in what's called the, the kir and ketheb, this is, a, this is a term, this is like a, a tool, if you will, I don't know what the best way to put it is, but it was how letters were counted when scribes wrote, like Isaiah, for instance, and every little, you know, if you've seen Jewish or Hebrew letters, right, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of little things to them. Okay, so they would be counted, and then the other would be how they're pronounced. And then, you know, the little guys with the long beards and the robes and stuff would all argue amongst each other. And that's not what it says. This is what it does say. It doesn't say that. Well, this is one of those places where there's a dispute that it said and not increased its joy or that most of the people were brought down. Their joy was like, like a buzzkill, right? And then... In, the, in this translation, in every other translation I searched through, I couldn't find anywhere in what I guess you might call the maybe Greek or the Christian version of it. It all said increased joy. Now, for me, 
I'm a, I'm a contextual reader, so I read, you know, the beginning and the, what I'm looking at, and then through, like, you kind of, you read the whole thing, and then you can kind of get a picture. It's, it's, to me, it's way better to try to understand something than to take one verse and make a doctrine out of it, which people have done, okay? And people have made doctrines out of the, or made dumb doctrines out of some really good verses because they chose not to include the beginning or the end of it. So what I'm seeing here as I'm reading, God's word says, hang in there. It's going to be tough, but you're going to get through it. It's going to end. In fact, prophecy is going to show that there's going to be a great light that comes into your life. You're going to see it. And not only are you going to see it, but I'm going to put it right exactly where I say I'm going to put it, somewhere way down the road, so that you'll know that I said it when I said it and I meant it and when I, what I say I mean. Remember on Saturday we, we read that and uh, I think it was further down the road in Isaiah. This is God's word or God's purpo- God purposes to do this and it will be done. You know why? Because if God says it's going to happen, you know what happens? It happens. So I'm reading it like this. You've multiplied the nation and increased its joy because he did increase its joy. Can you imagine how many people and, and we know that there was a lot of people on Palm Sunday that, do you remember Jesus rode in on the donkey and they're like, woohoo, Hosanna, Hosanna. They did all the branches. Like that. They were joyful and happy that their king had arrived. And I know that a lot of people will, will say those same people and the next day were like yelling, crucify, crucify. Factually, that's not true. Factually, that's absolutely not true. There was thousands of people in Jerusalem that day and there was many people there at that trial that were not part of that crowd. I don't even I can't even imagine that that people would switch gears that fast. But anyway, a different group of people. So there was joy and these numbers were increased and clearly it went around the road and, and then check out how the prophecy just gets blended into all this stuff. It says they will rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest. Now, as we're talking about this harvest thing, when, uh, here's a little, a little uh, I don't know, liturgical? Is that the word, liturgical note? Is that when words mean something, I guess? In prophecy, when we see, when we see the word harvest, unless, unless we're, we're in a historical section of something that we're reading, like maybe back in Genesis or Exodus or even Joshua, something like that, harvest generally refers to salvation. Or, you know, as, as we see it further down the road at Pentecost, that whole thing happened at the wheat harvest. It's a barley harvest. I think it's a wheat harvest. And it was the bringing in of souls, bringing in of the wheat or the grain, whichever it was. And so as we're reading through this stuff, we already know that we've been, we've been talking about, we've talked about rapture. We've talked about the second coming of Christ. We've talked about um, the tribulation. We've talked about a lot, all this, all these end time prophecies here in Isaiah that, that took place in the time of Isaiah and also the, the symbolism of it also took place in the time of Christ and all this is going to take place as we continue down the road and this harvest, that the, this joyful harvest and the men rejoice when they like as they divided the, the spoil, and you have broken the yoke of his burden. This is that. This is the salvation. The speaking of the salvation. This is this time. It's a very close. It's a very close line right here at salvation, rapture, and the second coming of Christ. We're going to see it all happen right here in these three verses right here, three through five. As we see this harvest of the salvation, the men rejoice in the divided spoil. The broken yoke. Sin has been. De- destroyed, and then look at this, and the staff of his shoulder and the rod of the oppressor, as in the day of Midian. And you, you look at that and go, what the heck does that mean now? What is this whole Midian thing, and how does it play into prophecy? This, you have to go back now, again, and, and look at Gideon, the story of Gideon. And I'm sure some of you know the story of Gideon, right? All the, the cool, um, what was the, the thing he put out there, like a leather vest or something? Put something out there. Something he put outside, and it got wet. All right? Okay, Scotty. Thank you. 
Yes, a fleece, according to Scotty. But that wasn't the point. <laughs> the point was the battle that took place. You remember the battle in the valley? There was thousands and thousands of Midianites. As far as the eye could see, their numbers were like the stars in the sky, the sand, and all that stuff. And Gideon had how many people? Remember, he had a bunch. Don't forget, he had like 20,000 or some big number like that. And then God started like click, 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 chopping it down. Remember the whole lapping with the water and all that business? Down to 300 people. They had jars, lamps, right? And they had their little, doo -doo, the little shofar looking things that they had. And he said, go around the valley, post your 300 guys. And at one time, you blow the horns and shout and you break the jars and fire, right? And so they did that, and all the Midianites flipped out, woke up out of their sleep, pulled their swords in the dark, and just started hacking away at each other. They all killed a whole bunch of each other, and they ran away, and then the guys went and got them and all that stuff. Well, how does that play into prophecy? I don't know if, if it like rings any bells with the trump, a shout, and a light, right? The same thing that he's trying to explain here and put into words that we would understand. They would understand the whole Midian thing. They heard the history. They knew what happened with Gideon and all that stuff. And they knew it was a great big victory. They knew that the Midianites were coming through and causing all kinds of ruckus. And they also knew that Gideon, with only 300 guys, miraculously wiped out this whole gigantic tribe of people, right? But for us, down the road, Salvation has come. There will be a trump blow, and that will be rapture. Just as, as we're talking about here in this rejoicing, and there will be a catching up. We'll, we will be caught up. There will be a miraculous shout. Now, now there's a verse, and I didn't find it because I got onto something else that I was doing today that talks about with the shout of an archangel. I think it's in like, First Thessalonians somewhere, and it talks about the rapture with a shout and the trump that will be caught up, the, and it speaks of the rapture. But it goes on to the second coming, it, and this is all happening right here. So we've gone through salvation, we've gone through the rapture, and now check this out, verse 5, for every warrior sandal from the noisy battle and garment rolled in blood will be used for the burning and fuel of fire. And the second coming of Christ, post-rapture, remember we're going to have rapture, we're going to have tribulation, which we won't have tribulation, and the second coming of Christ is going to be this big battle, well, not really a big battle actually, the surrounding of Jerusalem, you know, the whole Antichrist doing his craziness that he's going to pull off. And they're going to be like, come on, God, we're ready to dig it out. We're ready for you, man. And God's going to come out and go, boo! Actually, I don't know what the word's going to be, but it's going to be like one word. And they're all just going to be smoked. It'll be done. And that fire, there's going to come a point of judgment where people will be cast forever into a real place called hell. A real place. The fire, the Bible refers to it as a lake of fire. And it's really going to happen one day. So how is all this supposed to come about? I mean, it's just in the Bible. I mean, it's just written. It's just testimony. I mean, it's just uh, prophecy and stuff like that. But how does that really apply to us as Christian believers in Christ? Right? Verse 6. For unto us a child is born... Unto us a son is given. Now, I need to notice that there's capital letters, and I've shared with the whole what that means. Deity, God. A child is born, and a son is given. Now, I know that there's doctrines out there that will argue that Jesus is this, the brother of Satan, or that Jesus was just a prophet, Jesus was just a man. In one little half of a verse here, According to our faith, for unto us a child, capital C, is born flesh. I don't know if you've noticed this, those of you that have children, that when they're born, they come out with flesh. 
and needy flesh like from the get-go, right? For unto us a son is given, a capital S. And remember what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave, his only begotten Son, capital S. So we have in two little, in one sentence, the biblical proof of the God man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God born to us, humanity. Isn't that cool right there? Now it's, now it's starting to come into view for us right here. And he says, and the government will be on his shoulder. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've had it up to my neck with governments. I, I don't make a big deal about it here, as some sometimes do, but I will pray for our government because his word calls us to. Have you ever had to choke out prayers? <laughs> oh, Lord. Right? But I'm a firm believer that if you don't pray about it as a believer, then you probably shouldn't whine about it. Amen? Kind of like voting, my, my view on voting. If you don't show up to vote, then you probably shouldn't talk about politics too much and complain about them, right? I mean, I think you get certain rights. Well, the same thing here. But... Again, going on to the nevertheless hang in there, we're not going to be under the governments of the world forever. We may be long dead before any of that happens, and that's okay too. We won't be under the government anymore either, right? That way. But what if, just what if, the government was under G right now? If the government, which would be the world, because he is the king of all kings, which translated into our vernacular he's the king of all presidents or all rulers or regimes or whatever the heck it is what if that were to transpire right now what kind of a world do you think this would be because in order for that to happen just so you know all the sin of the world would have to be gone because the world that jesus is going to rule as king of kings which he will will be a sinless world. It'll be a world without Satan. And it'll be a world without sin. It'll be a world without disease. It'll be a world without pneumonia and things that kill us. It'll be a world without illness and evil and riots and things like that. So we know that if that's the way it is, based on Revelation is what I'm, I'm basing. I'm not just coming off of this myself. This is based on the word of Revelation. Okay, then a lot of things have to take place before that happens. And you're like, well, that's a bummer. We're going to miss it. No, you're not going to miss it. In fact, you will be the recipients of this government that he's talking about right now. Yes, the government will be on his shoulder, but it will be the government of heaven. He'll be the king of kings of that government. And he says here, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Now, I don't know what the comma's there for, to be honest with you. I mean, he is wonderful, and he is a counselor. Personally, I think we could lose the comma and call him the wonderful counselor because that's what he is, at least to me and to many others. He is the ultimate counselor. He has the right words to say. He knows exactly what to say, even when you're standing there looking at someone and you have no idea what to say. And you just keep your mouth shut for the most part. If you're smart. Maybe it's not smart. Let me take that back. If you've had enough experience to know when it's best to keep your mouth shut at that moment, right? Well, he is the great counselor. He does have all the right words. But we seek him out here in these pages, and then we shut up long enough to listen and let him speak to our heart by his Holy Spirit. Amen? But here's the cool thing about the wonderful counselor. We might get a good word from him, might get a direction to go from him and it might not even be a direction we're necessarily comfortable going but it'll be the direction that he speaks well once that happens then then we can either try to plow through on our own and hope we make it or we can fall on to the next thing they call him the mighty god the second thing they call him is the mighty god because as a mighty god 
what he says he makes happen. We've already read it. We've seen it. We have proof through the whole word of God. If God says it happens, it happens. All right, well, if he says this is what's going to happen, I can believe on him that he's my mighty God and it's going to happen. I might not be the way I want it to happen, but check this out. There might be a sting when here, a sting alert. God knows more than you and me. He actually is smarter. <coughs> no, believe me, I've, I've never put myself up against God, amen? But look at this. If any of that happened, let's just say it wasn't the way you wanted it to roll. But by faith you rolled it. It wasn't the funnest trip down, you know, the road. But on the other side, over the horizon, you're like, wow, man, I'm so glad I went this way and not that way. Turns out that way is full of thorns and briars and fires and rattlesnakes and all kinds of other things that aren't cool. This was a little rocky. It was a little bit of a challenge. But I made it, and here I am in this other place right now. Then we meet up, the next thing, the everlasting Father. And this is, this is the the truest heart of a father. How many fathers do we have in here? How many people have a desire to still love their children? Okay, I do too. Amen. Well, there I've met people that aren't like, well, like, eh, I love them, I guess. Yeah. Now, I didn't have the greatest dad on the planet, okay? My dad was an alcoholic. He was an alcoholic as long as I can remember, as long as I only knew him for 19 years, 18 years before he passed. Well, I didn't even know him that long because I was a baby at some point in there. But he was a good friend of mine. Didn't have a lot of great advice. Um, you know, as a dad, you know, now that I'm a father and I think of the things that, you know, I would do or not do with my kid, when, uh, when he would get his visits, you know, it was a divorce thing, and we'd be doing the weekend thing, you know, go fishing and, you know, go to the mall or whatever. My dad's idea was to go to the Silver Dollar, a little bar in El Monte. And I would play shuffleboard and, and I would drink them, all of them. It didn't matter who it was. And I'm, taking, I'm talking like six, seven years old here, all right? And I could drink everybody in that bar under the table every time. If they were putting down... Jack Daniels and scotch and water and vodkas. And I would go toe to toe with uh, Roy Rogers and Shirley Temples. And within five, they were just down. And I'm like, ding. Actually, there was a little pool table and it had these little things you slide across this string. Remember that? That's two down. Boop. And they'd fight. They'd do it. And I, you know what I grew up listening to? Hank Williams Jr. And. You know, the, this country stuff, man, and it was really cool. And I, I really liked it. And uh, I couldn't get my head around why my mom was so pissed when she found out, man. <laughs> my sisters ratted my dad out, man. And, man, mom was really uptight. I'm like, it's really fun, mom. <laughs> you know? And I even knew where to go when the fight started, behind the shuffle table, because it was like the strongest thing. I just sit back behind the shuffle thing, watching everybody do their thing. Okay, so growing up, I get it, my dad wasn't the best dad in the world, all right, but he taught me one thing. He said, don't screw with the old guy at the end of the bar. That's pretty much the only thing my dad taught me, and as I grew up playing in country bars, I watched these little peacocks come in there and, like, bump the old guy at the end of the bar, and man, that old dude, when he had enough of it, it was like, boom, 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 quick business, and it was over, man, and I'm like, boy, my dad was smart. <laughs> he was a wise man. I'm sure glad I wasn't that idiot down there that's wiping the floor up with his face. It wasn't until I got saved that I found out what an everlasting father was. Now, I'm not mad at my dad. My dad knew the Lord. My dad was a, he, he wasn't a youth pastor, but he taught kids, man. My mom played piano in the band, man. I guess they would call it choir back in those days. He, he couldn't kick the habit, man, you know, but do you think Jesus loved him any less? Of course not, man. And and you know what? My mom loved my dad all the way to the day he died. She just couldn't have him around us. Amen? She was responsible. She raised four kids. She was a great mom. Okay, but I learned what an everlasting father was all about. And, and I'll tell you what, man. God's been good to me. He has. I haven't been that great to God, but God's been really good to me. Amen? 
And he's got the heart of a father. When, I need, when, I, when the discipline comes, it comes. Amen? When the love comes, it comes. When the wisdom comes, it comes, man. He's faithful. And then, ultimately, the Prince of Peace. This is where, this is where it all comes to fruition at the end. We're never going to have peace in this world. And if you think that you will, you're a little deluded, although I'm happy for you if you're living in that kind of woohoo, Alice in Wonderland place. I mean, right on. This world is not governed by the Prince of Peace. It's governed by the Prince of Darkness. And we exist in this world for one reason, man. And the one reason is that we do this verse... 14 of, chap of Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. Let your light so shine. It's not going to be easy. How is it going to be easy, man? The world hates us. And I know you're like, oh, I don't have a bunch of people that hate me. Well, I assure you, the world hates you. And Jesus said they're going to hate you because they hated him first. But nevertheless, nevertheless, let me go back over there. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. Yes, it's hard. Life's a drag sometimes. Not always, but sometimes. Nevertheless, we are going to plow through. We have a wonderful counsel, a mighty God, an everlasting Father, a Prince of Peace. And I want to share with you guys something. 2,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, I don't track of time here. That Prince of Peace was born into this world, did what he had to do to secure everlasting peace. Right? Because if it hadn't happened on the cross, everlasting peace would never be, ever. Now, he goes on to say here, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Now, now we've fully moved past rapture, tribulation, second coming, judgment, the end, and on into the new Jerusalem, the new world, the king of kings. This is where all these titles become what they really, really, really are. The Wonderful Counselor, forever. Mighty God, forever. Everlasting Father, forever. Prince of Peace, forever. The government and peace will be no end because what does no end mean? Forever, right? And check this out. Just to kind of put an exclamation point on this thing. He says, upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice, with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. This is, this is a, a messianic statement saying that the person that we're talking about here will fulfill the prophecy that the King of Kings and the Messiah will be of the throne of David, King David. And we know that Jesus was of the lineage of David and he would be over his kingdom. And David was considered the greatest of the kings that Jesus would be the king of kings. And the only way that's going to happen is for the opposition to be removed. Now, who is the opposition? The other guy, right? So we're talking about ages past, all that madness, all that lake of fire, all that place called hell to be locked up, destroyed, gone, forgotten. And we will be established as his, his kingdom, and he'll be our king from that time forward for how long? Forever. But you got to hang in there. Nevertheless, having a bad day, having a bad year, having a bad couple years, right? Having a bad 10 years, whatever it is. Nevertheless, hang in there, hang in there. And I tell people, man. There's a lot of stuff that we go through, and you're like, man, why? Why is this happening? And sometimes, in the course of our life, we'll run into people, and you know what they're going through? The very same thing that you just walked through. The very same valley of the shadow of death that you just walked through. The only difference is, you're on the other side of the valley, at the horizon, and they're just taking their first step in it back there. So what do you think you have to offer to these people? You have any wisdom? Any help? Any hope? Absolutely, man. Because you know where you are? You're on the other side of the valley, and now you're a light on a hill. 
that they're looking at. They're looking up on the top of that hill and like, well, it's not just pure darkness. And there's a lot of darkness in this valley, but there's a light way up there on the top, like a little red light on top of that camera. I see you. And you know what? They'll head for it, man. Because why wouldn't you? I mean, if, if you look over there and there's nothing but pitch black, and you look over there, there's nothing but pitch black, maybe some growls from the mare over there. Maybe some chirps or, I don't know, what's a mean bird sound like? <laughs> from over there. Okay. I ain't going that way. I'm heading for that light right there. And they get through the valley of the shadow of death. I remember, you know, that I, I like to think of that valley as that, you know, the poem of the footprints where Jesus is carrying you. I like that one right there. I especially like the part where he's like, so what happened to you when uh, I was all going bad and I only had one set of footprints? Where were you then? All the, ugh, you know, getting all attitude and stuff. You know, I had probably answered it totally different than he did in the prayer or the poem but nonetheless we'll get through the valley and you get to the other side and they run into you over there does that mean you've arrived at perfection because you're on the other side of the valley any at all kind of check this out you've got experience from this valley and you have something to share you got something to say something valid with some like some meat they can sink their teeth into. And they're like, hallelujah, because that's where they just tromp through this valley. Like, wow, I made it. And you're like, and, and then be blessed and go with God. I'm out of here. You turn around and take a step, and right down another valley you go. And you're like tumbling down, bam, hitting every rock on the way down. Boom, 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 boom. That Chinese checker, is that what it is? Or cheesy? You're like, wow, why again, man? Kind of tumble up and land on your butt. You're knocking the dirt off and the blood and the guts and the beer. Well, maybe not the beer. This is John Wayne, Johnny Cash song. Boy named Sue. Remember through the wall? Okay. I just heard it the other day. I'm trying to find somewhere to sneak it in. <laughs> anyway, so there you are in your mess. Now you're the one sitting in the valley. And you look up and lo and behold, there's a light on the top of a hill. Because somebody else already tumbled through that valley. And made it to the other side. Such is life, this side of heaven, man. Now, we can lay down in the valley and die, I guess. If Jesus is going to let you, I doubt it. He might drag you a little bit, prod you. I don't know, whatever it is. But think about this. How many stinking valleys have we already got through, man? Why stop here? And of all places to stop and pitch a tent, why do you want to do it in the valley of the shadow of death right look man nevertheless hang in there this is what he says at the very last part of this verse 7 here the zeal of the lord of hosts will perform this not the zeal of crusher yeah does he need to show up of course all right we gotta we gotta get in the fight man but it's the zeal of the Lord that's going to carry Crusher through. It's the zeal of the Lord that's carried Crusher this far. And he knows it. I know it. In my life, I'm not qualified to do what I do, but the zeal of the Lord still says do it. And here I am. Amen. We're not qualified to do a lot of the things that we do, but the zeal of the Lord is. And he's going to keep moving us forward. And this is where we're going to stop right here. There's so much in the book of Isaiah. In fact, in, in this one little spot, I could have read it at Titus, Daniel, Judges, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Chronicles, 1 uh, Chronicles. I could have, there's so many places we could have went through this right here. And you know what? Because I know that now about this, it just might be that one day, somewhere down the road, we just take chapter 9 and just tear it apart for a few months. I don't know. But I can tell you this, the book of Isaiah is going to be huge and big, and we're going to get a lot out of it. We're going to learn stuff. Some of it's going to be beautiful and awesome. Some of it's going to be a little harder to learn. But what year is it right now? 2022 right now yet? 21 still. We're still in 21. I'm just trying to get away from 20. <laughs> See how far we can get away from 2020. I say, I prophesy that in 2023, we're still in Isaiah. Maybe. We'll see. 
Because we're only in chapter 9 point, not even 9.5, almost 9.5, halfway through. And we have 65 of these to go through. Amen? In the book of Isaiah. 65 chapters. And 66, actually. I, take, I, I knew you were going to, I was trying to get it up before you said it. But I didn't, I, as I, I got to 65, I'm like, oh man, there's another one. He's my resident Brian over there, man. Praise the Lord for people like Scotty, right? Okay, 66. Yeah. We'll be here for a minute, and it's going to be really good. I mean, here's your get a question tonight. Are you ready for the light to come into your darkness? I'm telling you, man. Um, just because we're saved does not make everything okay, right? But there's a light that can come into that darkness. Does it mean you're, let me just, let me ask you this question. Does that mean you're going to just, woof, be swept out of your darkness? I mean, does anybody believe that in here? Yeah? Because you know what? It's not going to happen. And unless he wants it to happen. I shouldn't say it's not going to happen because I can't say what God's going to do or not going to do. But let me tell you this. Have you ever been locked in a closet as a child with shaving cream in your mouth? I've got a weird childhood, all right? But I found a flashlight in there. My brother was a real big brother. Let me put it that way. And this is just weird that I remembered this because I can't remember really anything. But I found a flashlight in the closet. And this is back in the days when they were like metal and they had like the big thing on there and like the 3D size. Anybody remember D batteries? <laughs> they were huge, okay? And I turned that flashlight on, and, and it was pitch black in there, man. Like, you, know, you couldn't see nothing. I was probably freaking out is what it was when I got my hand on it. It had the big button on it. You remember those big buttons on there? I think it even had one that you push, like you do like Morse code if you knew who Morse was. And furthermore, if the person on the other side was like, are they having a flashlight problem over there? <laughs> dot, 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 dot. Anybody know that one? <laughs> okay, prepper. Anyway. Yeah, he probably got food the last 25 years in his closet, too, over there. Anyway, turned it on, man. That, that closet, it was, like, so bright in there. And it, it was really comforting, just so you know, as a child. To, I mean, I was, like, really, only four or five, maybe. It was really comforting to have that light. Well, the same thing, okay? We might, we might, get, we might see that light. Jesus might come and might answer prayer, might give us things, Amen. That light can come into our darkness. But we're still in the darkness. And, and I want you to try to understand that. All right? This side of heaven will always be in the darkness. This world is an evil, ugly place. Amen? But we don't have to sit there in the dark. We have a light if we choose. Amen? Look at the, the next one here. Do you need some time with the Prince of Peace? <laughs> Anybody going through it right now? Okay, how about here's a, here's a better, easier way. Anybody not going through it right now? How about there's probably less hands that'll go up in the air. Everybody's got stuff going on right now, amen? Whatever it is, yours might, yours might be just absolutely earth-shattering to you, <laughs> right? And like, oh, man, what am I going to do? Then I think, I don't know how to get through this, man. I don't know what to do. Should I you know, start doing drugs again? I don't know. What's the problem, man? Well, I need to put a tire on my bike, man. That's it? <laughs> I mean, no. I mean, oh, that's terrible, brother. Let's pray on it. <clears throat> that's how I pray, anyway. We don't know from one person to another how they're coping with stuff. And there's some people in here going through some pretty serious stuff. Right? Peter's really in it right now, man. You know? And we're going to keep him up in prayer. And, and he's, he's standing as strong as a man can stand that just lost second son and you know who he's you know who he's looking to for his strength you know who he's talking about he's talking about you guys he knows that you're praying for him he knows that you love him and he knows that you're there for him that wasn't the Peter that I met four years ago when his son Patrick was killed but he, st he hung around man he, he has a religious background but 
it wasn't deep into the word and that close to Jesus. I'm not saying the guy was a heathen or anything like that. But he's come to know Christ through the family and the fellowship and hang around. That's why he won't go away. And we don't want him to go away. Right? Let me share with you guys something. Peter, John, has been in the hospital for two or three weeks now. I'm not even sure exactly when this pneumonia thing kicked off. But if you guys were here Saturday, then you saw Peter sitting right there in that chair. And Peter John was in an induced coma over in Riverside. But Peter came here. And I, and I can't tell you how admirable that is, that he, knows, he knew, at least in his heart, where he needed to come. He needed to be here in this place with you guys. And then he went back <clears throat> to his son. And he was with his son right to the end. Amen. And we're going to circle the wagons and we're going to try to help our brother find some peace in this time. Amen. And it breaks my heart. It really does. Um, to, uh, to see anybody that we love go through such a hard time. So here's the application. Night. Don't give up. Hang in there. God is still on the throne. And he's going to still be on the throne tomorrow. He's going to be on the throne the next day. And check this out. When it's all over with, when it's done, when I go home to be with the Lord, God's going to be on the throne long after I'm gone. Amen? And when this whole world finally goes to hell, metaphorically speaking, it's gone. And, the, and God's kingdom, the new Jerusalem, as it says in Revelation, in all her beauty, like a bride adorned for the wedding. When this all happens, and everything that's evil is gone, praise the Lord, from this world, things that mess with us, that have been killing people from the very beginning of creation, with Adam and Eve in that old garden, when it all entered the world, God will still be on the throne when it's all over with, and for all eternity beyond. Amen? So if you want to put your marbles in a basket, put them in the basket that's on the hill that's lit up. Amen? All right. Hey, keep your eyes on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your word, Father. And, and once again, Lord, we do lift up our brother to you and his family right now, Lord. Father, we, we you know what, Lord? I'm In my brain, Father, I'm, uh, I'm going to thank you for the reunion that's happened today in heaven, Father, with these brothers that have met yet again father and i thank you for that i thank you for your promises on our salvation i thank you for your word and giving us something to stand on and a light to look towards father and tonight as we close lord if there's anyone that feels they need to come back to you maybe come do you for the first time if there's anybody out there that's watching this that says man i want to i want to get in on that unto us a child is born thing well, it's called salvation. And that child's name is Jesus Christ. And he loves you. He loves you. And tonight we're going to pray together as a family. You know what? Maybe, it's a, maybe tonight's a night to just look up at that light. Amen? Maybe, it's, maybe tonight's a night to really give Jesus a chance. So we're going to pray as a family. And I invite you to pray along with us. Amen? Let's all pray together. Father God, I've sinned against you, Lord. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And Jesus, I invite you into my heart to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and put me on that road that you'll have me travel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Let's give the Lord some praise. I guess I kind of jumped the gun on the keep your eye thing, didn't I? It's like I was kind of like looked out there and you guys were like, like uh, do we say it or not? <laughs> My bad. Well, here's the deal. I didn't give you one of those either tonight. Amen. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. God bless you guys. Pray for Peter.